what is going on folks this is season two of the tread we are plugging it in here with another narbc vendor and someone who has been in and around the reptile hobby for a long long time i'd like to welcome everyone here we have scott miller from sambo's by scott miller how's it going scott going good how are you doing tonight yeah not too bad so, you know, I know this is something, you know, back when we were doing season one here early into the spring, that was something we kept getting so many people that are really excited about. They're like, man, you, you got to get a boa guy on here. You got to get someone who does something different on here. We're tired of ball pythons. We're tired of geckos. We want something that's different. And I was super happy. I want to give the shout out, uh, SRS Exotic, Sean. Thank you so much, you know, for making the connection here to be able to get Scott here onto the show because, um, I mean, I think Sambo is, I mean, are, it's super fascinating, you know, species in just, you know, boads in general. I mean, we were just talking before the show started. I mean, depending on how it's classified, you were saying there, there's roughly anywhere from like nine to a dozen or so species, plus or minus. Yeah, it just depends where they lump some of the subspecies um, when they when they reclassify them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you you've been doing this now for, you know, 30 plus years, you've been in the reptile game. I mean, you know, one, I mean, what, what drew you, you know, to, to really, you know, kind of be that, that Boad guy and, you know, specifically, obviously the Sambo is, I know you do some things with some different types of like Bolivians and stuff, but I know Sambo is, is what everyone knows you for. So what kind of, kind of drew you there and made that kind of your, your niche or your passion? Um, in the, I think it was like 1991 or so. Okay, I got my, yeah. my my first adult pair of Kenyans uh, at a local show in Illinois, which was also one of the original reptile shows. It was Lee, Lee Watson's Reptile Shop. Yeah. So, yeah. Excuse me, Lee Watson's Reptile Swap in Streamwood, Illinois. And um, I got my first adult pair of Kenyans there from a guy. And they those, those were also the first species that I bred. And I just, I you know, and I actually got to see that first litter be born. And I, it just kind of hooked me. I was just fascinated with them, you know, and back then there was just lots of normals of different color tones and shades or morphs right. didn't even pop up for a few more years. So, um, but they were just what fascinated me, me the most as far as something to focus on. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a really unique animal. Cause I think, you know, people consistently, you know, sometimes when they hear the word boa, they're always worried, you know, size. Oh, I don't have this size for, you know, a big, you know, they think Peruvian and Cernan, these gigantic red tail boas. They don't realize that there's actually a, a boa species that we have, you know, sand boas. I mean, we're maxing out, you know, in that that really reasonable, like what, three foot, four foot range roughly on an adult female? Uh, most Kenyans, most females are around two and a half to three feet. Um, I've seen some female Indian sand boas that were four, four to four and a half feet um but that's kind of that's exceptional yeah um but you know you're you're looking at an average size of about three three two and a half to three feet for most of them right so, and, and the males are the males are significantly smaller they average about 18 to 20 inches or so i got you yeah and i mean when we when we talk about you know all these these different species obviously the the kenyans are the one that i think you know obviously is you know kind of taking the world by storm on all of them just because it's it's the most easily readily available one that we see but I mean, obviously there, there's different ones out there. I mean, out of those different species, do you have one that's a favorite? Is it, you know, the rough scales or is it the Indians or? Um, probably the, I like the rough scales, um, just as far as, um, looks and stuff. Um, the Kenyans are a lot of fun because there's so many morphs and combinations, um, but I also have Indians, um, and javelins, which are very unique and, yeah hardly anybody working with javelins anymore um and there's actually two two or three uh they, you know, they used to be classified as different subspecies i don't know if they still are or not but um there's there's very few people that have javelins anymore um right that, that breed them and stuff but um i think i think out of everything i have probably some of the rough scales are my favorites yeah i mean and, and i mean you mentioned the javelins i mean if i'm I mean, the javelins, those are the ones that I think are found. Are those the ones that are found in Europe or something like that? Or um, Yeah, they're found across across Europe and stuff. Um, they're highly protected over there. Um, so they. I don't think there's even a lot kept in captivity over there. Um, but, yeah, they're, 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 pro they're one of the more widespread. And depending on which area they're from, they, they vary in color. 
not so much in pattern, but just in color shades and stuff to match kind of the surroundings that they're in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, do you, do you have all the different species then? So obviously you've mentioned, you know, I think probably about four or five already. I mean, or do you work with only a select few out of those nine to kind of a dozen species that are out there of sand boas? Um, I have Kenyans. I have pure rufescens, which um, are from Ethiopia and Eritrea and Somalia. They used to be their own species. Then they were a subspecies. Now they're just lumped in with uh, Colubrinus, uh, the Kenyans. Okay, yeah. Um, so I have those. I have the three species of javelins. Uh, I have Saharans, which are the Mulari, which are one of the two species of Samboa that lay eggs. Yeah. Um, and the rough scales, I have uh, Persians, which are the um, Persicus. And then I do have Indians, the Janai. Um and yeah, that's so. I've got I've got mm, a lot of them, um, but not all of them. I did I did right. have more at one point, but then I kind of just started to focus on a little bit fewer than what I was doing. So. Yeah, yeah, and I know obviously you know obviously besides some that have some size differentials, and obviously the rough scales that actually have a you know a physical you know feel and differentiating factor when you actually touch them and feel them. Um, is there any like noticeable, I guess, for someone who's looking to potentially add a Sambo, is there like a noticeable like characteristics or kind of temperament difference between the different ones? Or are they all roughly, you know, still kind of that, that same type of, you know, care, temperament, classification as far as being able to work with them? Um, the care is pretty much the same across the board for them. Um, temperament wise, I've always noticed that my rough scales tend to be a little jumpier, a little nippier, especially, uh, as, as when they're young, yeah. um, my javelins always tend to be, uh, more prone to musking when I pick them up and handle them. Um, John, and I are usually very laid back and easy to handle. Uh, most Kenyans are too. Um, right. but you know, they, they do tend to have aggressive feeding responses. So using a small snake hook to get them used to being touched let them know it's not feeding time and kind of get them out of the substrate is always a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I think that's, that's another kind of, I think unique thing is, you know, most people, I think, you know, when we think about, you know, snake breeding and stuff like that, people think, you know, colubrids, people think ball pythons, blood pythons, reticulated pythons, but you know, with, with, with the sand boas, I mean, one, I mean, they're going to bury themselves in that substrate. So, I mean, what is that, what's that process like, you know, with a male going to go find that, that female that's potentially buried, is there anything, you know, specific like tail wagon or something like that, that he specifically tries to do to get her out of the sand or does he just kind of go digging to go find her? Um, usually what the males will do is they will kind of burrow and crawl across the top and sides of the females and they'll rub their chin back and forth as they go, like kind of side to side. Yeah, yeah. And the, the males will also use their spurs and they'll kind of uh, tickle the female. And that will usually get her to raise her tail and she'll kind of wag her tail. Um, usually, depending on the substrate, um, but if it's if it's like sand or walnut shell, something that they really can burrow and hide in like that, right. you'll, you'll see their tails above the surface of the substrate when they're actually locked together. I got you. Um, and then like, like stuff like, um, Cypress or Aspen, um, you'll still see their tails, but they won't necessarily be like fully above the substrate because right. there's, there's room under the substrate for them. Um, but the, the, the males will, will really, I mean, their little spurs will get going pretty quick, um, to, to tickle the females and the, the chin rubbing is very vigorous. So they, they, they work hard to get them in, in, uh, to get the females to be receptive. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think the other thing, too, I mean, for folks who aren't familiar with boas and stuff, I mean, sand boas, like you mentioned, outside of those couple of, you know, species, I mean, they're they're live bears. They they produce live birth, which I think is, you know, very unique. I think a lot of people, they think reptiles and they think, you know, typical things like, you know, tortoise eggs, gecko eggs, ball python eggs. They don't they don't think about that, that live birth. Uh, you know, process and kind of what, what goes into that to be able to get successful, you know, live birth out of the animal. So, I mean, for, for folks that, you know, kind of are, aren't used to that, you know, kind of take us through that. Obviously, once, you know, there's been that ovulation, we know that there's going to be birth. Um, I mean, are you constantly kind of, how are you kind of controlling those different, you know, factors, environmental factors, given that, that mom's going to be the one actually incubating versus a, you know, a, a Coca-Cola cooler or something that someone's fabricated? 
Um, mainly just keeping the the hot spot of the heat the heat source at a consistent like ninety four to ninety eight degrees, so they can kind of pick and choose exactly where they want to be. Um, keeping them hydrated, um, they do drink a lot more water when they're gravid, um, and just very very minimal handling. Um, offer I offer uh, smaller food items um, once a week or every couple weeks until they start refusing, and then I just let them be. And just check on them once in a while, check the, the temperatures and make sure the water is full. Um, but pretty much uh, it's, it's a hands off because they can get stressed they'll, and they'll flail, they'll bite. And it's, you know, it's, it's best to just leave them alone and, and disturb them as little as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm kind of curious because everyone has these, you know, different methodologies. Obviously, you've been in the industry for so long, too. I mean, are you using anything like the little, like, I know some people, they go and they check for heartbeats on bow ads to try to see and count how many babies. Some people are using ultrasounds. Or are you still very much, you know, old school, you can kind of see and just tell from all the different signs and stuff? Um, yeah, I still go by just the behavior and, and the signs. Yeah. Um, I've I've never tried ultrasounding or like fetal Dopplering on their, uh, on their, while they're, they're carrying. Um but I just kind of, I just kind of go by the, by their behavior and um, what they're doing. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned obviously with working with all these different species, you, you mentioned the rough scales. I know, you know, we were talking also a little bit as well. I mean, you were really excited, I think about one specific project with the rough scales. I mean, this year, um, you know, tell us, you know, a little bit about, you know, kind of what you're able to prove out and, you know, where you kind of think the the potential is with this uh, exanthic rough scale line that you were telling me about. Um, this season, I was able to prove out a recessive exanthic trait um, in the rough scales. Um, and it's it's the first time, like anything to my knowledge, uh, it's, it's the first time there's actually been a recessive morph in rough scales. It's been proven out. Um, there are albinos that are found um, in India, they're na- where they're from, but I don't know of anyone that's actually bred them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so this would be the first like captive, um, captive bred and proven uh, recessive morph of, of rough scales. Um, I mean, if if someone outside of India was able to get an albino, um, you know, snows could be created. You know. Um, there is also i've seen a t positive albino so t positive snows um but again it would have to be outside of of india but i do have um different colored lines of high yellow high gold Mm -hmm. um i have uh, a hypo trait that i work with so it's possible that i could make ghosts in the future um so i'm I'm kind of excited because there's different combos and, and patterns to play with to try and enhance what what, what, a, what the azanthic looks like so. right yeah no I, I think that that's really i mean exciting i mean i think that people you know they always think about you know with some of the morphs and stuff with other things like you know leopard geckos ball pythons there's been so many morphs that have come out and it's you know made everything kind of go crazy but i mean in, in the sambo world i mean what i mean kenyan samboas there's roughly i mean how i'm just trying to think just with kenyans how many morphs there are i think maybe is it a is it a dozen or 20 or um standalone morphs i'd say there's probably oh maybe a dozen or so okay yeah um maybe if maybe maybe a little bit more um but then you have like polygenic traits um right and um different different combinations of of the morphs so you there's probably 20 to 25 i think by now yeah yeah we got we got will here will will's uh will's fanboy in here will uh philip he, he wants he said that you're a great guy and he's uh loves your passion so uh, i appreciate that he's he's a really good guy too he breeds a lot of very cool pythons i've known him for quite a long time so. oh yeah yeah no I, i've known will now here for about i think two three years as well and i i agree i mean it's it's always unique, I think, for someone like me, you know, where you talk to someone like yourself or Will that either, you know, has so many either years in the hobby or works with something that, frankly, is just it's just different. You know, you just you just don't see it. You don't see the volume of it. So when you see something, and you see someone who's able to produce it and produce so much variety of it. Um, you know, I think that's what's you know really unique. I mean, I think if, if anyone's gone and even just seen, you know, your Facebook page, I mean, I know when I reached out to you originally, I was seeing stuff and I'm like, 
I don't even think I've I've seen some of these either patterns or colors or styles of Samboas. I mean, it's uh, it's really fascinating for me. And I think what's really unique is that the the color doesn't seem to you know have that aging effect that I feel like you see with some other like python species and stuff where there's that that fade and stuff like that, that people talk about with like ball pythons you see that nice richness and color and like bright oranges and yellows and stuff and they they hold to adulthood i think that that's that's really unique and really appealing just even from a collector and just a keeper perspective that that's one of the nice things with kenyans is that the majority of them you know, instead of dulling as they age, a lot of them will actually get brighter as, as yeah. they grow. Um, so, you know, if you buy like, you know, a, a small young paradox albino over the next six to 12 months, it's going to, you, you know, the oranges get richer and deeper. Um, same thing with Dodomas, which are a locality. They're pretty plain and pale when they're born. And it you know, by the time they're a year old, they have just just super clean, crisp red or orange. Um, there's also a yellow phase that's very attractive. Um, but the the Kenyan the Kenyans, yeah, they just they look better as they grow instead of instead of browning out or fading. So. Yeah, yeah, I think you you hit on something too. I mean, for people that aren't familiar with it, I mean, break down you know the difference you know because I know we have a lot of people that are that are are morph type people that are used to thinking you know leopard gecko morphs and ball python morphs, but Break down, you know, when we talk about locality, we're talking about obviously a specific region or something and how they how they look in the wild versus a morph, which is, you know, an adaptation of the gene. Is there is there one thing you prefer over the other, the morphs versus like the localities or? Um, I, you know, I, 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 I love a lot of the morphs and the combinations and stuff, but um, a pure um, clean, um, pure Dodoma is probably just one of the prettiest things you can, you can get in, in as far as the Kenyan Sanboa. And they, they come from an isolated, isolated valley, the Dodoma Valley in Tanzania. And they have kind of a, um, a more open, reduced pattern, like thumbprint spots instead of where everything's okay. connected and just a very clean, crisp orange, uh, to red, to yellow. Um, they have a pale, um, clean head with no, no, pattern they don't have the eye bars that go from the back of the eye to the corner of their mouth um they're just a much much cleaner crisper looking kenyan and um it's, it's really hard to beat just a natural looking pure to doma yeah yeah and, and i think the other thing too is i mean you know boas in, in general i mean before birth actually happens i mean if i'm not you know incorrect here apologize but i think it's what is it it's like four months or something like that for sand boas before they produce birth or something like 90 plus days 100 it's, days um i it's usually de depending on the species and when they ovulate it's usually about 75 to 95 okay. um sometimes a little bit longer um it always seems like my rough scales will um give birth to their letters uh, well, this year, most of them gave birth about a month or six weeks before my Kenyan litter started dropping, and everything gets paired at the same time. So the rough scale seems to be, uh, they seem to be a little quicker, um, you know, but even, even with Kenyans, a lot of times, depending on when you catch the female in her cycling, you know, you can have, I've had females that I've paired later in the season give birth before the ones that were paired earlier, just because of, I caught them at the right point and the male but the males and just everything sort of clicked into place you know right away and they just kind of sped through a little quicker than than the other ones do yeah. um, and some people uh, i've seen will the, they'll start counting down to babies from the time they see the first lock um but really you have to try and catch the ovulation because that's when that's when you actually need to start counting down from is, is the ovulation so because they'll be i mean not uh, I've had females get bred for two to three months before they ovulate, and I've seen females ovulate days after a male being introduced. So yeah. it's, it's all about catching that ovulation and counting down from there. So right, I mean, when we look at, I mean, I know like when I look at like boa breeding versus like python breeding, like you hear a lot of python breeders, you know, we'll we'll go, you know, put the same male to you know three, four, five, you know, sometimes even more than five different females. Uh, with with bow ads, that's a little bit different from what I've understood. I mean, kind of how do you, what's your process? I mean, is it one male to one female? Is it one male to only select like two or three? I mean, how much can a can a male actually kind of be spread out through a collection? Safely? Um, 
Uh, safely two to three, but I, I only if he's if he's feeding uh, right. during the breeding season. Um, if, if they go off feed, I wouldn't do more than to one female, just because once he's done with that female, hopefully he'll go back on feed because um, they can't actually breed themselves to the point where they just don't recover. Yeah, and they'll you know they'll they'll pass because they they just don't have the energy to start feeding again and stuff. But um, three is probably the most I would try if if the male's feeding. Um, usually, what I do is I'll do one male uh, or two to th- two males with um, a female if I'm really hoping to get babies from a certain pairing. Right. Um, and in some things like the rough scales, if I'm doing um, multiple pairings of the same line or color and pattern, I will group breed them. Okay. Uh, you know, I've, I think I've had up to 4.4 together at one point in, you know, a large tub. So they have room, yeah. um, but I've done like 4.4 and I, I notice it's not necessary, but I've always had better success with like javelins, rough scales, and even, uh, John, I, if I use multiple males, um, and it, you don't have to use multiple males, Um, but it just, it seems to, you know, that competition seems to really spur them into action. Yeah. Um, and with some, I can, I've also used like fresh shed skins from other males of the same species. You can kind of get the same effect, but, um, multiple males always seems to really just generate a lot more action. Yeah, no, I I think that's interesting because I know like in the wild, like certain other, like a lot of some of the South American, like boat species, like yellow anacondas, green anacondas. I mean, I know that those are, it's typical. You'll see a pile of them sometimes in the wild and you'll see one female at the bottom of the pile or something or two females. And there's all these males, you know, fighting for competition. I didn't know if potentially even in sand boas, if potentially any of that is observed in the wild with that would maybe contribute to that group pairing kind of concept. Um, I, you know, I've never seen or heard of anything. Um, mostly, most of what I've seen about their reproductive behavior is just the gestation and the number of babies and the time of year they'll give birth. But as far as the right. actual breeding, um, I, you know, I, now that as I think about it, I've not seen any anything about the actual breeding and mating um, in any of the the books that I have. And I've like, I collected a lot of field guides from where the different species are from. And yeah, um, they don't talk about the actual breeding, just, you know, like what season or what time of year that, you know, they're most active. And, but as far as like how many males will chase a female, I've never seen any information about any of that. Yeah. So. No, I was curious. Cause when you mentioned that, like I said, it made me think back to, you know, the Anaconda thing. And I know that, like I said, in South America, you'll see that, you know, I don't know around the Amazon. So uh, Will's wanting to know, and I'm probably going to butcher this Latin name because I suck at English as it's as it begins with. But uh, he wants to know if you work with your rinks, Jacari or Jacari, uh, the Jayakari. Um, yeah, not in a long time. They're the other species of egg-laying samboa, um, and they're very, very rare in captive collections now. Okay, um, I only know, actually, I only know of like two people that have. Um, breeding groups of them um, and the females can be prone to egg retention um, the babies can be difficult to get started um, because they're very small and they tend to prefer lizards okay. um, yeah. and I, I did know a gentleman years ago that was probably one of the best most prolific breeders of Arabians uh, I'd ever come across and unfortunately I kind of lost touch with them over the years but um, he would use baby viper geckos to get his hatchlings to feed and then start sending pinkies and stuff. And he had a lot of success with switching them to rodents, um, doing that. But, um, there's, there's so few people that have pairs or small groups of them to work with. And I wish I still had some of mine. Um, and I did get eggs when I had them, but I, I never was able to successfully hatch them. So, yeah. um, but they're they are they are the most unique and they are the only species that's truly found in sand. Um, like most samboas are their eyes are kind of angled more towards the top of the head. Right. With the Jayakari, they're literally on top of the head. So they will when they're burrowed under the sand, you'll you'll see just the eyes and the tip of the nose, the nostrils poking out, um, and nothing else. And they, you know, like they look um 
they don't they they look like a, a um like a sock puppet i hate i hate to use that kind of term yeah. to describe something so unique and fascinating but they they almost don't look real the way the head is and they're very they're very short they're very stout um they have beautiful um orange and and tannish orange banding and stuff um but the eyes just are so unique um you know, I, some people, when they see them online, they're like, oh, that's not even a real thing. That's something somebody made up. But no, they're very real, very rare, very interesting snakes to work with. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's pretty interesting. I appreciate, Will, you bringing that up. Um, like you mentioned, I mean, those couple of species are the only ones that that lay eggs out of the sand boas. Um, but then the other thing too, is like you were mentioning just the appearance, you know, with the Samboas and the facial appearance on them and stuff. Um, you know, I find that really unique. I almost think, and I don't know if you see this, but I know a lot more people that if they see a Samboa, they're less like if they're new to snakes, I see more people that get excited about holding a Samboa or wanting to see a Samboa than seeing a Python, you know, and I don't know if it's something just with the, with the face or the facial expression of a Samboa that makes people kind of like pull that like i'm afraid of snake guard down but i think that that's a really unique you know kind of concept with the hobby i don't know if you run into that but i know at least like for me there's a lot of new keepers that they see a sambo and they're like oh that doesn't look threatening they see a python or they see like a you know a typical red tail boa or something they get they get scared they get that snake uh phobia or whatever it's called um yeah i, I have noticed that quite a bit that people that are hesitant um to handle a snake will warm up to um especially babies uh yeah. a baby sambo as opposed to a baby ball python or a boa constrictor because the sambo's head shape is very non-threatening um you know they kind of they, they have very very broad shaped shovel type heads that are you know kind of the same size as the neck and they just kind of look like a you know a continuous shape almost like an earthworm or, or something like that and they're just you know they have, uh, oh, you know they have large eyes. Um, they're, they're just a lot less threatening and intimidating than than other other kinds of snakes are. No, right, they're right. I mean that's what I was gonna say. I mean that's I think like you mentioned when you said the sock puppet thing. I mean that's what hit in my head. I can't tell you how many you know folks I see if you if you put both side by side they'll take the sambo every single time. They're like okay, I'll hold that one for my first snake just to hold. And I think yeah. that that's. That's a, that's a great thing, I think, for, for the hobby. And that's why, like I said, part of the reason why I really wanted to have you on is because it's 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 a species, I feel like, that can really be great for getting that, just that education or reducing that that fear factor that some people have around, you know, snakes and reptiles. I mean, just because it looks so um, almost, almost cartoonish, you know, to a degree when you see how the eyes are and stuff. You really don't, you know, think that something like that could exist in the wild. Yeah, when when I've done uh, like educational or outreach shows in the past and taken a variety of, of animals, the sambos are always the most popular. Um, yeah, even even if I'm using like an adult um, male or female, even even larger ones, they're always the the ones that wa the ones that get handled the most and yeah. ask the most questions and stuff. So they're they're great for ambassadors for getting people in that are afraid of snakes. To get over that fear, if they're just getting into snakes, it, it, it's something that draws them in, gets them more interested. No, right. And I mean, I know, obviously, besides Samboas, you work with a couple other, you know, species and stuff and you have over the years. Um, I believe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the the type of red tails you work with are the the Bolivians or something, if I'm uh, correct. The, the, the Peruvian long tails. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. I knew it was one of the localities. So, I mean, obviously that that's like the whole the whole other end of the spectrum. I believe that that's one of the biggest, you know, on record, you know, red tails <laughs> that um, you can get. The well, the the longicottas are uh, somewhat of a, a quote unquote dwarf species. Okay. Um, the true Peruvians, um, the the boa constrictor constrictor, um, the Peruvian locality of those those get real large. Okay. Um, there we go. But, but the longicottas are are smaller and a lot a lot more manageable. Yeah. Uh, right. Which is to say they don't there are there are ones that do get big, but in general they're they're a little smaller, they're a little sen more slender. Yeah. Um, and you know, you mentioned that with the longicotta. So are those are those considered what are I, I think they're B are they BIs or they're still considered a type of BCC, but just a different locality of it or um, the latest or the 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 latest i saw was they're now boa 
Boa Imperator Longicado. Okay. Yeah, Instead I was going to say they, 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 they keep changing it. <laughs> on us. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it can be difficult to keep up with, but usually if you just say Longicada, anybody that's in the locality, Boas, is going to know what, what you're talking about. So, yeah. Yeah. Will, Will's throwing the questions at you today. So he, he's got another question for you. He goes, awesome. it's, been a, it's been a long time since he's any, owned any type of sand boa species. But he does remember back, like that the back half would have these uh, kneeled slash beaded scales. He goes, he can't remember which type it was though. Um, the Kenyans have on the back third of their body, the, uh, from the tail to about a third of the way forward, uh, their scales are keeled. Um, and it's um, something that they can use to like, um, as they burrow, they'll use that to, to collapse the burrow behind them. Okay. Um, yeah. and they'll also like, if they're, when, ha when they're being handled or, you know, like if a predator grabs them, they will kind of tuck their head in and they'll flail the back end and use it. Um, you know, the, the keeled scales will kind of cause a, a rougher impact and mm -hmm. they'll, uh, sometimes, uh, poke you with the, the little tip of the tail. <laughs> um, but Kenyan, Kenyans have the, the, the keeled on the back third, um rough scales are, are completely keeled from nose to tail right um javelins and um i believe i, I think tatarkis um i don't have to, i don't i have javelins have some keeling on on their back back ends um but like russians um indians uh saharans their scales are smooth all the way all the way from nose to tail so right um, it's, it's not, you know, not all of them have that, but the Kenyans, um, have the, other than rough scale, have the most keeling of the scales. So, yeah. Yeah. And like you mentioned, it seems like that that's, you know, something that they use specifically either environmental factors for how they're digging in their holes or for defense. Yes. Yeah. There, there you go, Will. So, I mean, the other thing too, I think is, you know, with someone who's who's been in the hobby, I think for as long as you have, you know, been around, work with so many different reptiles and animals and stuff. Obviously, the hobby's the hobby's gone a long way. I think from you know where it was, you know, thirty plus years ago to you know today. I look at it, you know, just even the the readily availability of reptiles in general. Um, you know, where do you where do you hope or where do you where do you see an area where like us as a hobby where we need to continue to you know kind of drive uh you know an improvement and you know or continue to kind of help drive that outreach um i you know i, I think I, I think if there were more people that did like uh, educational and outreach programs um you know as far as what keeper you know what the keepers can advance on i mean there's always new advances in, in husbandry as far as you know temperature control and ways to wait ways to keep them properly with ambient temperatures um lighting I, i've noticed has come an immensely long way since the you know the the beginning when i got into it and in, you know in, in the mid 80s and stuff yeah. the, the lighting that's available for everything and just the knowledge that like you know even you know nocturnal and subterranean ones benefit from the the uv lighting and stuff um and just just how they're kept um you know as far as space and you know natural substrates and stuff um you know seeing a lot of that become more popular is, is really pretty cool as opposed to like you know you know the old days when it was just aquariums and you know yeah. things like that so <laughs> yeah yeah, no, I think that the like you said, I mean, there's there's definitely become you know a lot more options and stuff out there, which I think is good. Um, big thing, obviously, I mean, for folks that, that don't know, I mean, you you do vend NARBC, which is you know I probably you know Tinley is probably one of the the biggest at least shows I think in the country still, if not the biggest still reptile show every single year. Um, you know, tell me about that. I mean, how how many years have you been you know kind of going to Tinley, you know, been able to show off your animals, connect with customers. Um, I have um, attended NARBC uh, in Tinley, excuse me, since the first one in, I believe it was 2000. Um, I have uh, vended since 2008, I believe. Um, and it's just, it, it's always such a fun weekend. There's so many people 
Um, you know, every, every, every show, the crowd gets bigger, the, the number yeah. of vendors increases. Um, it's, it's just an amazing experience. Um, and not, you know, those are, those are the, the two weekends that I absolutely will take off every year from work is, is yeah. March and October to, to go to Tinley. And, um, it, it's just so much fun. You get, you get to meet, you know, so many people that are getting into the hobby or new, um, I mean, I've had people that like, like we talked about earlier that were just intimidated by snakes. I've had people get their first snake as a Sambo and they just, you know, it completely changes their attitude and stuff. And they're, you know, they just love them. Um, yeah. but you get to a lot of, you know, you get to meet and hang out with a lot of great breed, other breeders and just, you know, share knowledge and stuff. It's just, it's an amazing experience. And just the stuff you can, you get to see there, not just Sambo wise, but, everything um yeah. the morsa and some of the you know even rare species and stuff it's just you know it, it's it's just mind-blowing like the, the, when i went to the very first one i, I walked in and i just kind of stopped and i looked around and i just my jaw dropped i was like you know and there was like you know uh, uh, you know music in the background in my ears it was just an amazing just you know, and, and for me, like three days isn't long enough to see everything and talk to everybody you want to talk to. No, it never is. It never no, is. it's but it's it's just it's such an amazing. I always come back from it feeling more energized and refreshed and, you know, just more more energized and focused and stuff than than when than before I went. So right. it's, it's nice for that, too. So. Yeah, no, I think that that's, you know, a unique thing. I think, like you said, is either, you know, one for people who are just keepers, they, they go to either their local reptile store or something and they don't know. And, you know, there's maybe five, maybe 10 species, 10 species, I would say is a lot sometimes in some reptile stores, you don't always see a ton of variety. Um, you go to Tinley and, you know, there's easily, you know, 50, 75 plus, you know, different types, probably over a hundred even, you know, between snakes and iguanas and geckos and bearded dragons and, and all sorts of, you know, odds and ends and, and rarities that you, you don't see. I just, you know, I kind of tell people, I'm like, yeah, I feel like it's the only place that you can go and get something the size of a penny, you know, in something like a micro gecko, or you can literally walk home and, you know, bring something home the size of a dog and a monitor lizard on the same yeah. day. <laughs> The, the, yeah, the, the variety and, and stuff is is just um, uh, amazing. I'm, I remember one in the first one of the first shows I went to, there was a pair of Grace Monitor lizards there, and yeah. you know, I, I, I I'm pretty sure that's one of the most rare of the species of monitors in captivity, and I don't think yeah. I've ever seen any more there since. Uh, then. But, yeah, the uh, yeah, that's actually funny. You mentioned that. <laughs> that so. That's been on my list. That's to me, that's one of my holy grails from the monitor oh, keeping oh. side that I want. And uh, I know that there was a shipment three years ago that was supposed to come in that was not legal to try to get Gray's monitors. It got stopped in California. <laughs> um, oh, man. But yeah, like you said, you don't you don't see that in captivity. But I, I even think I mean, looking back, you know, to your collection, I mean, even I mean, you don't see, I would even say a lot of those Sambos that you put on the table, you don't see those typically all the time, at, you know, anywhere. I mean, right now I looked tonight before the show, uh, out of all Samboas that are on Morph Market, just to compare people to ball pythons. So ball pythons, there's roughly, I think like 40,000 posted up right now. Samboas, wow. there's, Samboas, there's only like 500. <laughs> 500 and and some of them you click on and there's there's zero posted so you know i think that's what's unique is that i can literally go to a table like someone like you and actually see some of these species that of sambo that i just frankly otherwise i mean you you'd be at a loss you'd never potentially know that they exist or even potentially in captivity in the hobby to potentially obtain yeah it's um that i i, I, I always get a pretty pretty fair number of people commenting that it's you know it's it's nice that they can go to a booth and see something different and something that isn't as common or you know that that's stuff that some you know not everybody else has as far as like you know crested geckos ball pythons things like that where you know a lot a lot more people work with those so we're right we're still sambos are still kind of a 
um, I guess I'm a subculture for lack of a better term in, in the reptile hobby, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get caught up. We're, we're, yeah. we're better. We're a lot more than we used to be. We're getting there. So. Oh yeah. And like I said, I mean, you, you've been making sand bows cool for 30 plus years <laughs> now. I mean, and, and realistically, like I said, I said that because I mean, when I got introduced to you, you know, by Sean, you know, and Sean's, you know, putting it right here in the chat, he goes, you know, he's always having good conversations with you at Timley and checking out what you bring. Um, like I said, I've never seen some of the variety and coloration and pattern. And, you know, as someone who, who personally has a real soft spot for bow ads, uh, you know, when you see some of those, you're just, you know, your, your mind's blown because, you know, I'm typically always just looking, I hate to say it in the, in the ball Python lens. And then you see these and you're like, Holy cow, you know, what you can get in basically a, a real handleable, you know, package, not something that's going to be, you know, 15 foot, like a retic that has, beautiful colors, but not as easy as far as space wise to keep a Sambo. I mean, you can, you know, blow the doors off color and pattern wise and still be able to keep it in your house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's, that's one of the things I try for is, is to create, you know, um, you know, new, you know, improve on more, on more through selective breeding and try and co combine stuff to make more unique, and interesting patterns and stuff and a lot of it is just like oh i wonder what this would look like if i matched it with this and you know it doesn't always work out as well as i hope but you right. know luckily luckily more often than not it does yeah um so i i you know i i tend to hold back a lot of stuff out of what i produce but it's to continue trying to improve on what i'm working with and to make more unique stuff so that you know when when someone comes by the booth or looks at my facebook page you know, like they'll see normal Kenyans and, you know, normal rough scales, but they'll also see stuff that, you know, is, is unique and harder to find and, and stuff. And that's, that's always a lot of fun too, because it, it creates more interest and it creates more excitement in people. So. Yeah. And I think that you mentioned it hit on a, a key thing where you were talking about, you know, kind of, you know, what I kind of call the mad scientist part of breeding when you're trying to think about how you're going to put things together and what it might look like. I mean, is there like a, a process in your mind that you kind of go through when you're like trying to think about something cool or different you're going to make, or you just kind of sometimes like you sit down, you look at something one day and you're like, yeah, that would be cool. Let's do that. And you just kind of throw it in or. It's, it's usually like, I, I do some planning and whatnot, but you usually it's just sort of like, um, like well, basically almost like a random thought of what'll pop in my head of like, oh, let's try this and this together and see yeah. what'll happen. It's um, you know, because I'm I'll you know I'll be looking at stuff as I'm going through and cleaning and feeding and whatnot, and then all of a sudden I'll be like, ooh, I got this over there that I should put with this over here, and you know, so I'm all, I've always got like scraps of paper and notes <laughs> and lists and you know. Try yeah. this, try this with this, try that. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's yeah. always, yeah, you know, sticky notes on tubs and, you yeah. know, notebooks full of, you know, notebooks to jot notes in and stuff like that. Or, you know, yeah. sometimes, sometimes at work I'll think of something and I'll jot it on a scrap of paper and put it in my pocket and stuff. But it's usually, it's usually just kind of random ideas that'll pop in my head as I'm doing my regular maintenance and stuff with everything. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I wish people could see the rest of this desk, but there's literally paper that go from right here all the way down and all the way down to that wall on my desk and it's all different pairings ideas <laughs> yeah it's you know it it it, it, it um and, and that's part of the, the fun is the creativity the creative process yeah. doesn't really end it just keeps going and and that's that's one of the things that keeps the energy and the interest going and and stuff and you know i mean you know, it's, it's, it's a way to stay focused on the animals and what you're doing as opposed to like social media and stuff where you get, you know, frustrated with right. everything and stuff like that. It's, you know, it, it keeps, it keeps, you know, that's the part of the hobby. That's the best part is working with the animals and, you know, figuring out directions to go with colors and pairings and stuff yeah. like that. So, no. And, and I want to highlight that there, there's some words of wisdom for anyone who ever watches this episode there. The social media part. So many people that are getting into the hobby focus so much on social media or trying to keep up with, oh, this guy produced this. I got to catch up. I got to do this or I got to do this or I got to go buy this species now and work with this species. Focus on what you like. Worry about yourself. Write down your own projects and just, just do it. Like you said, let those creative juices flow. 
you know, and, and the reason I wanted to point that out is like I said, you've been doing this for 30 plus years. And I mean, I think it's real easy to see just how much energy you have, how excited you still are about the species, how, you know, much time you put into them and just knowledge. So, I mean, I think that's where, where most people want to get, but people, like you said, they get sucked into those funnels of social media. It gets into their brain and they, they forget about the, the original goal, why they got in, why they loved it. And uh, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's some words of wisdom there for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, and I mean, well, back when I started, you know, you had to pick up the phone and call someone yeah. to talk to them and pick their brain, or you had to travel to, you know, a reptile show and, and hope the person you wanted to see was going to be there and stuff. And, oh, yeah. you know, now it's, it's so easy to reach out, but it doesn't have the same impact as, 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 you know, sitting down or standing around talking to someone and, and having that face-to-face -face interaction and stuff. And it's, you know, it's much more, you know, like when I, when I first got into Sambo is the, the, the go-to guy for me was, was a man named David Sorensen and he was a zookeeper in Milwaukee. And I would see him monthly at the Lee Watson reptile swap. And, um, you know, he was, he was a tremendous help at that, you know, at that time, cause you could get, you know, wild caught like javelins, Russians, Tartars in, and, you know, he was a huge help trying to, sh you know, help figure out, okay, I got this. It was labeled as this. Is it really this or whatever? And showing me ways to I identify what I had, yeah. um, you know, and just the, the knowledge. I mean, he had been to Russia and studied stuff in the wild there, including Russian Samboas and, um, you know, like with, with Russians, you know, at the time of year they're born, they're born, they go through their first shed and they basically um, hibernate for, you know, six to 12 weeks or however long over there. So in captivity, you know, over the years, people have, people have found, you know, okay, they're born, they shed, boom, put them in, in a, in a, um, like a, a wine chiller for, yeah. you know, six weeks or whatever, then bring them up and then, oh, they start feeding great. You know, I think, I think rubber bows are the same way maybe, but, uh, but he was just, just a tremendous influence and just um, so much fun to talk to and ask all these questions. Cause he, you know, he always, he always had an answer. He always knew what I needed to know. Um so it's just, you know, those are the days that were great, you know, that, you know, these days are great, but those were the good old days. Is, oh, is, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, that, like, then that's part of why Tinley is so fun is getting to actually interact with people yeah. face to face as opposed to just, you know, uh, you know, through uh, instant message and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Sean saying those, yep. stream, those stream wood shows. <laughs> yes. Hey, yeah. Sean. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think you hit on a good point. Like you said, I mean, I, I think Tinley and some of these shows, I mean, what's so special, like you said, is that, that personal, that personal interaction, that, that personal connection. Um, you know, I, I say this all the time. I really still believe this is a relationship built hobby. That's how everyone learns. I mean, you, there's always somebody that has some nugget of knowledge that you don't have that you can gain. And especially now when you have people who have been in, you know, 10, 20, 30 plus years now, uh, there's so much out there that I hate to say it, uh, Googling it, chatbot GPT, it's not going to give you the answer, guys. AI yeah. can't solve everything. There's some things that are just, they're, they're hidden in years of experience, knowledge, seeing it, feeling it, working with those animals on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just, you know, for me, like I said, that's what shows like Tinley. I mean, that's what it's, a, what it's about is, is finding people like you that, it's the only way that you're going to get that knowledge. You ain't going to see it, you know, written on somebody's Reddit or something like that. Exactly. And it's, you know, yeah. I mean, there's always, you know, there's always bits and pieces of, of hidden gems of experience and knowledge to be found that, you know, like you said, isn't going to show up on Google. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, we're, we're looking at, it's, it's crazy to think, but I mean, we're already, we're already into August. I think we're literally almost exactly, or just over two months out from Tinley, yep. six, 60 days from Tinley. I mean, fall Tinley, I feel like everyone, you know, both fall and spring, people get super hyped for spring. Everyone gets out of winter hibernation and fall. Everyone's excited because it's like the last big thing of the year. And then it's the holidays and in the blink of the eye. Yeah. Going, going into Tinley, I mean, if someone's looking or interested in a Sambo and they want to come to your table, what are, what are some of the, cool things maybe you're excited about that you're going to have on the table this year 
Um, I will have some very nice um, Genex paint stuff. Um, I'll have a, a variety of Splash and Paradox Splash. Um, I will have um, some Paradox and Hypo Paradox uh, Splatter stuff. Um, quite a few Pyridomas from different litters, and some are some have more of a heavy heavy pattern. Some will have more of a reduced pattern. Um, I have a lot of rough scales with a lot of um, color and pattern differences. Um, might have some Sunset Indians if I'm lucky, but, um, we'll see what happens. Um, and, uh, I'll have, um, you know, some normal stuff. I do a lot of, uh, Annery, um, yep. cause Annery, no, no matter what, what morph it is, Annery always looks to me the best because it's, you have the most contrast between the, the black and the white or the black right. and the gray. Um, so um, I, I have some really neat stripe combination stuff. Um, so far, I've produced some really nice high expression uh, Paradox Albino and um, Stripe Paradox Snows and Stripe Paradox Albinos. Um, so I should have, hopefully, just a nice variety of stuff. Um, should have some nice Stripe Albinos. Um, let's see what else do I got down there. Let's, um, I have some real nice hypo stuff, um, Stripe Hypos. Uh, I know there's stuff I'm missing, but that's why I label. <laughs> that's why I yeah. label everything and write everything down. So. No, right, right. I mean, I think that that's eight tip. That's uh, that's part of the fun, folks. I mean, you got to go to the show. You got to stop by Scott's table because even if he lists off 20, 30 different things that are going to be here, you still know that there's going to be another ten to twenty things that he didn't <laughs> list off. They're going to be on that table that are going to wow you, you know. And I think uh, you know that's a big thing. Like I. I'll be honest. I mean, when I was looking at your page, man, when I started seeing the rough scale stuff, that's cool. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you, you know, very much. you know, for for someone like me, like I said, that that's cool. I'm big on like when you see things like, especially with reptiles, if there's a texture tool, you mm -hmm. know, um, it, it's sometimes like for me, it's not just all the visual appearance. It's just also the the feeling when you hold the when you hold the snake, when you hold the lizard. How does it feel, you know? And I think that that's just you know, it's very very unique you know, on there in that animal there. So I think that I'm, uh, I'm going to go bullish here. Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, we're, we're going to make rough scales, uh, cool here going 2023 into 2024 folks. So, I'm fine uh, with that. <laughs> so, uh, folks, I mean, if you haven't, you haven't seen a rough scale sand boy, you, you gotta go check that out because, uh, like I said, for someone like me that, you know, is only typical to your, you know, your typical Kenyans and stuff. When I saw those, I mean, to me, that was, that was cool. You know, it's just, it, it's different from a boad perspective. I don't know how many other boads I can think of that have that type of texturing on them. Um, I, you know, I think there's one, um, uh, round, the round Island boa, um, I think has keeled scales and, uh, South America. There's the, um, the trachea boa. Yeah. Um, I think those have keeled scales, but yeah, as far as, you know, something you can see and put your hands on. Um, rough scales are probably the most unique out of all of them. No, right. Uh, and uh, and there, there's not that many reptile, like there's not too many snakes out there I can think about that have keeled scales that you can hold that also potentially don't have some type of a venom impact. <laughs> that, yeah, there's that too. I mean, they, you know, I mean, a good sized female can have a hell of a, hell of a bite, you know, oh, yeah. if it's a, a feeding response, but yeah. Um, it's one of the few you can handle that's, you know, feels like that and you're not going to have to be in fear for your life. So. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to highlight that because, I mean, you look at some of the species when people start talking about like South American vipers and stuff and it's like, yeah, there's cool stuff, but <laughs> a little bit different kind of a punch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's def definitely should be hands off. With yeah, stuff. exactly. Exactly. But I mean, kind of coming here, you know, to the kind of the top of the hour here. I mean, uh, you know, looking ahead to kind of the second part of the year, we talked a little bit about Tinley. Uh, we talked a little bit about kind of, you know, some of the most excited kind of breeding pairings you had with some of the Atlantic rough scale stuff. Uh, looking ahead, you know, kind of into the fall and into 2024, is there either a new species or line or is there something that you're kind of real excited about to kind of get going on with the project or maybe a new addition or something? Um, um, I, I think – one of the one of the things I'm I'm really excited about trying is uh, breeding some of my Saharan samboas, um, especially the 
they, they call them sunburst or um, I've seen them called leopard or tiger, but basically they're, mm -hmm. they're, a, they're a very reduced pattern as far as the brown. They have a very clean, bright yellow or orange. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying some of those and see if I can get um, eggs and, and hatch those out. Um, so I've, I've got a bunch. Um, I, just, I just I haven't tried them yet. Um, so I'm looking forward to trying those and seeing um, if I can be successful with those. And I'm uh, also looking forward to trying um, my Persians. I've, I haven't been able to breed those yet. And uh, there's only off the top of my head, there's only four, four, maybe five people I can think of that actually have um, pairs or groups of Persians to work with. Um, and like the only time those, the only time those were imported into the country was one of the first Tinleys in the early two thousands. Um, and a friend of mine happened to buy the whole group from the person that had them. So all of the, all of the, the, the Persicus that we have, the Persians, those are all from that one imported group from, oh, 20, 21 years ago. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you wouldn't think they would be that difficult to, to breed, but um you know persians have still kind of eluded me with with being successful you know i'll get them to copulate but the females don't ovulate you know and don't produce young so you know gotta gotta always be trying something different and you know thinking outside the box to be successful with some of the some of the rare things so. yeah and, and again that's where talking to people that have been successful and work with them comes into play because you know my friend that's been successful with them a number of times, you know, every, every year when I start pairing them, I'm like, all right, I talk to them. I'm like, all right, what, what do I need to try? What do I need to do different? You know, and each time I try something different, it gets me a little closer, but you know, the information I get from him, you're not going to find anywhere else. You know right. I mean? You're not even going to find it on social media because he doesn't do social media. So. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> and exactly. And I think that's another key point. When something's not working, be open to advice, looking for those outlets to be able to get that advice from and realize that they might not be, like you said, on social media. Um, I think that's another big thing. There are so many people I feel like you see that get stuck in their way and they just say, oh, it's just not working. It's not working. It's not working. Yeah. But they're not willing to tinker, you know, and again, it's just want, want people to take note of that, you know, from someone who's been doing this a long time. It's okay to start figuring out if something's not working to make those adjustments and slowly, you know, try to get closer to the end goal. You know, I think that that's uh, just something like I said, I want to make sure that gets highlighted too, because I mean, like I said, if you want to stay in this hobby for a long time, I think like you, you've highlighted, you got to be willing to adapt your processes and be able to seek out information from, you know, all different types of sources. And parts of that is getting to know people in person. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you have to stay open minded, you have to be willing to learn, you have to be willing to try, try new things to, to, you know, to make to make yourself successful and make things better for the animals themselves. Yeah. Um, it's... Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and, you know, kind of coming here to the top of the hour, you know, from my side, you know, I was super excited about this episode to be able to talk and learn about something different, you know, than the usual that's out there. Uh, be able to talk about something that I think is very, you know, selective right now in the hobby, but at the same time that there's a lot of growth potential uh, with Sam Boas and Boad. So I'm really excited about kind of seeing where that growth and where kind of also just take the hobby going forward. So I'm really pleased that you were able to come on the show and kind of be able to share and spread some of your knowledge with myself and all my viewers that will go and watch this episode now for years to come. Uh, I'll take it and leave it away to you as far as, you know, what you want to say to obviously everyone watching, you know, what they should look out for, for Tinley wise with you. And, uh, we'll kind of, uh, go there and kind of wrap up this episode. Um, I, I want to thank Sean and everybody else that, that put you in touch with me. And I, I really enjoyed this. This was a great time and, um, stop by my booth at Tinley and yeah. say hi, uh, check out all the, the, the new and odd and weird stuff that I've got going on and, um, you know, as always reach out and ask questions if you're not sure about something. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There you go, folks. I mean, this is Scott Miller from, you know, from Sam Boas by Scott Miller. If you ever want to get into Sam Boas, learn something about Sam Boas, reach out to him, talk to him, stop by his booth at Tinley, see his awesome selection and just pick his brain about stuff. You're going to be really impressed folks. I'm Nick Karaskevich with the tread. 
I wish you all a wonderful good night. And next week we are going to be jumping on the show with sharpshooter reptiles. We're going to be talking colubrids, folks. Talk to you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.